You know, there are certain states that embody a sort of rebelliousness. Sure. A kind of maverick attitude. Mm -hmm. Sort of, we do it our way here. Yeah. Can you think of any states that are like that? Anything below Tennessee is a rebel. This is a state of renegades. You can't be finer in Carolina. We're pretty independent. Has it got us in trouble? Uh, I don't know. Define trouble. In a country with 50 different states, not everyone can agree. But some states stand out for the strength of their convictions. And their independent streets help set their shapes. Powerhouse Texas could have been five states. A brash Montana may have fought its way out of Idaho. And the divided Carolinas could have stuck it out together. In Charleston, they dip their colors to no one. What do they all have in common? Whether it's owning guns or grilling meat, it's their way <laughs> or the highway. It's the history hidden in our map, how the states got their shapes. In this episode, State of Rebellion. There is an independent spirit in every one of the 50 states. After all, the nation did get its start by rebelling against England. But there are some states that stand out more than others for playing by their own rules. And it's all rooted in how they got their shapes. Do you know where Montana is? Oh, yeah. Montana would have to be about right. You had the pencil. Here's a pen for you, too. Oh, dear. I had right here. Montana. Right here, which one? Montana. Right here. Yeah. I was going for that exactly. Okay. Oh, you're both going for that. Okay. You're both, you're both correct. Okay. Ooh, good. That's Montana. I just got back from Montana. Okay. okay. Yeah. Montana occupies one of the most unforgiving spots on our map. Its landscape is about as rugged as it gets. This is Big Sky Country. It's not surprising people here are independent-minded. And they've got strong opinions on a topic that divides many of our states. Guns. Oh. Ah. Damn it. Around here, some people don't like being told what to do, especially when it comes to federal laws and something as basic to them as firearms. Are you going to hit this one? Yeah, this is the one. Keep your head on that stock. OK. Keep the gun moving. OK. Break it. All right. Oh. Ah! That's not bad for a cable guy. Sixty-one percent of households in Montana own a gun. Only Wyoming and Alaska rank higher. In Montana, guns come with the territory. The state is so sparsely populated, only six people live in every square mile. Compare that to California at 228 people per square mile. This state is still very similar to when it first got its shape. Out of all the states, Montana most embodies the Wild West the notion of lawlessness and, uh, you know, everything we've come to know in old westerns. In Montana, gun shows are a place to bring your family. Montana's a gun state. It always has been. The arms are the mark of a free man. Do you think it's rebelliousness or just, um, just patriotism? It's not rebellion. Montana believes in the Constitution. They believe in the Second Amendment. The handgun is your last-ditch attempt to fight your way back to where you left your rifle. <laughs> where you have your bigger gun. Yeah, that's right. Here, the way things used to be doesn't seem so long ago. How much does something like this cost? They're $22,500. Wow. These spurs came out of, a, of an old saloon. Cowboys would come in and run up a bar bill. They didn't have the money, so they'd trade, trade in their spurs they would... <laughs> for the bar bill. <laughs> yeah. Guns are as much a part of the Western history as anything. It's all a part of our culture and our history.
So how did Montanans become so fiercely independent? Well, the answer lies in the story of how this state got its shape. 1861, the West is taking shape in the wake of California's gold rush. Back East, the Civil War is beginning. The two events are about to collide and create the shape of a new state, Montana. First, Congress carves out the Dakota Territory. But a few years later, a gold discovery in the far western mountains sparks a new gold rush. Congress senses a bonanza, and it wants to control the area. So it creates the Idaho Territory around the mines. Settlers stream into the territory, putting up new mining towns like Bannock. In this harsh landscape, it was every man for himself. Bannock must have been a pretty dangerous place to just ride into at one point, but before Montana was a state, when it was a territory. Bannock was a very dangerous place, especially in the first years. Not so much to ride into, but to ride out with your gold. That was where the danger came. There were a lot of people that liked to mine the miner, so to speak. They would uh, actually just spend most of their time in the saloons, and when they heard that someone was leaving with a big poke of gold, they would waylay them, rob them, sometimes murder them. Who begins to populate Montana? Who wants to come here and seek a fortune? Everybody, everybody. But you had many people from the South. 1863, 2,000 miles away, the Civil War is raging. The mining towns in Idaho become a western front in that bloody conflict. Washington sends wagon trains to keep rebellious southerners in check. That's why the government sponsored these wagon trains to get some northerners out here to make sure the south didn't control the gold fields. President Lincoln then brings in some muscle. He sends a federal judge, Sidney Edgerton, a former Ohio congressman, to maintain order. Edgerton faces a daunting task. The Idaho Territory is split by two mountain ranges, with the territorial capital on the far side of the mountains. Travel, even communication between east and west, is nearly impossible. The people of Bannock want to control their own affairs. So they send Edgerton to Washington, with enough treasure in his pockets to put Montana on the map. A lot of the townspeople, the rich, wealthy shopkeepers and miners here, uh, supplied Edgerton with a lot of gold and sent him off in the winter. And he went back to Washington. So Edgerton goes into Washington, D.C. with all this gold. Is he going in there to pay somebody off, to bribe Congress, or to, to purchase the, 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 the land rights to, to what would later become Montana? He actually took the gold to impress people, to demonstrate the wealth that was available for the country. But some believe Edgerton went to D.C. to buy Montana, a territory of its own, with gold worth $145,000 in today's money. Clearly, this was mining interests bribing congressional representatives to give them the boundaries that they wanted. And what Montana wanted was some of the land Congress had meant for Idaho. The original plan was to draw the border along the Continental Divide. But the Montana plan pushed the border westward to the crests of the Bitterroot Mountains instead. That's why Idaho looks like Montana took a bite out of it. Gold had everything to do with the shape of Montana. Montana's shape was determined by the owners of the gold mines and their influence in Washington. Even today, the outlaw spirit that drew the first settlers to Montana thrives. From gold to guns, Montanans have always been determined to do things their own way. Would you say that the independent spirit of Montana comes from that sense of people uh, living in a rough land that was ungovernable, and today, you know, they're not, they're not fond of being controlled by this faraway government, centralized government in Washington, D.C. that doesn't quite understand the Montana way of life? 
people are real con really concerned about their freedoms here, and you know they're very independent. You know, people had to be self-sufficient when they came out here, and for many years and generations, people that lived in rural areas had to be self-sufficient, self-reliant, and do do for themselves. There's another fact about the West that feeds the tension between residents and Washington, D.C. Take a look at this map. The federal government still owns a lot of land in the West because it actually owned the West before it was settled. Today, 30% of Montana's land is Uncle Sam's. Without it, Montana would look like this. The amount of federal land all around them often makes Westerners uncomfortable. I think there's a kind of, sometimes a resentment that sets in. Because if the feds control so much land, then they're gonna be federal officials, Bureau of Land Management people, Forest Service people around, sort of telling the locals what to do. And this often doesn't sit very well. No issue polarizes the two sides more starkly than the conflict over guns. The folks in Montana don't just talk big about gun rights. A few of them have even started to make guns of their own, claiming that they don't need a federal permit to do so. I'm on my way now to meet one of those gun makers. What can you tell me about uh, Montana off the top of your head? I think a rural area, kind of Western people, Western wear, Western style. It's a place where Ted Turner keeps his, uh, his buffalo. Self-sufficient type okay. people. Very resistant to having sort of uh, government control. People in rural areas like that, I'd say they'd be pretty much independent, yeah. In Montana, rebelliousness can be a virtue. Here, it's always been about states' rights and defending their way of life. One of the reasons people went west historically was they were impatient with authority in wherever they came from. They tended to be these folks who wanted to do things their own way. The independent-mindedness of the west, which existed from early times, is still embraced, is still celebrated today. In these parts, most people believe guns are a necessity. The county we live in here, Beaverhead County, is larger than the state of New Hampshire. At any given time, there are only six deputies on duty. We don't have police here, we have deputies. Mm -hmm. So six policemen covering the whole state of New Hampshire at any given time. The odds of you calling them and being here are slim, so you need to be able to take care of yourself and your neighbors. Rick Salata makes and sells guns. Well, sort of. He doesn't have a license, and federal law requires one to sell firearms. So the guns Rick sells are only partially complete. By not finishing them, he avoids breaking the law. In here, you'll notice that this is solid, where the fire control components go in, the hammer, the trigger, and selector for safety in that. Mm, this is called a receiver. This is the receiver. Okay. This is the firearm. Okay. And then we also have to drill a few holes through here, mm -hmm. and then it's ready to be assembled. So this is the only part you're making? Correct. That's it, right here? Correct. This, from my um, unskilled eye, looks completely harmless and just like a piece of metal. It is. But the question of whether Rick's a gun manufacturer has gotten him into some serious trouble with the feds. So when the, when the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, when they roll up on you, uh, what is that like? Well, they had six black SUVs. They had helicopters up in the air. They had snipers on the hills. Um, snipers on the hills? Yes, snipers up on the back hill there. Really? Montana is now leading the charge to change federal gun laws. The state is pushing a new law that would lift regulations on guns if they're made and sold within the state. If Montana's new law survives, it will mean a big victory for states' rights. Rack the slide, you can see the rounds in there. Yep. And Rick could sell customers the same finished weapons he makes for himself. So guns and gold helped give Montana its shape and continue to shape its rebel spirit today. 
From firepower to fire brands, I head south to a place where a rebellious streak helped build a nation. How would you describe the, the, the you know, the, the spirit of South Carolinians? Yes, I would, I would say we beat our own drum. In Charleston, they dip their colors to no one. I remember seeing Joe Wilson on TV. Everybody was fussing about him shouting, you lie. I will say that is purely within the state's character. I couldn't imagine anybody from any other state having an outburst like that. The infamous exchange involved a congressman from South Carolina shouting at the president. That outspokenness can be tied to how this defiant state took shape. One war forever cemented South Carolina's rebellious reputation. But it's not the war you might think. Yes, the state famously earned its rebel stripes when it seceded first from the Union to spark the Civil War. But it was another conflict almost a century earlier that built that pride. South Carolina first showed its mettle by rebelling against the British. The upstart colony kicked out their royal governor, wrote a constitution, and elected a president months before the Declaration of Independence. And in June 1776, when the British showed up looking for a fight, Charleston was ready. Well, the British, as you know, uh, got into a little fight in Massachusetts at Concord and Lexington. But of course, um, the Massachusetts men ran away, and so there was really nobody for them to fight, and they took over the port of Boston. So they thought they'd sail down to South Carolina where they'd fight some real men. When British ships attacked, they couldn't get past the Charleston fort. The secret? The local palmetto tree. The fort was made of spongy palmetto logs, which turned out to deflect British cannonballs. Final score after the nine-hour battle? South Carolina one, England zero. One thing about South Carolinians, they do not run away. And so, you know, General Moultrie, William Moultrie, and his men stood firm right here under deadly fire where the expert military men said they couldn't win. The victory and the palmetto tree were launched into state folklore and gave South Carolinians a pride they carry today. This is the first significant victory of the American troops over the British in the American Revolution. I mean, this, this gave people in South Carolina and around the, uh, the country the feeling that the British fleet could be defeated. But the battle wasn't the only confidence booster for this southern renegade. South Carolina was also one of the richest early colonies, thanks to lucrative crops like rice and indigo. Which brings us to another question. How did we end up with two Carolinas anyway? 17th century America, the Carolina colony stretches from the east coast off to the west. But the colony's two ports are nowhere near each other. So Carolinians in the north and south become as far apart culturally as they are on the map. South Carolina, when it was part of the Carolina colony, was really the settlements around Charleston. Very, very wealthy people, very tied to the British, well-to-do. While the South prospered, the North was turning out to be a tougher landscape. The northern part of the Carolina colony, a lot of Quakers up there, uh, hard scrabble tobacco farmers. Realizing just how different the North and South had become, England cuts them in two in 1710, ultimately giving North and South Carolina their shapes. So South Carolina began as a colony with strong beliefs and even stronger trees that helped set this state's notorious rebellious streak. It's a quality that helps define this state today. I think that we're uh, firm in our convictions and our beliefs and we'll, we'll not hesitate to say if uh, we disagree. Oh, very independent. Everybody does what they want. Nobody follows anybody. With a map as fragmented as ours, people are bound to disagree. But as we've seen, a state's strong opinion is a clue to its unique past. It can be something as big as Montana's attitude toward guns, 
rooted in its rough history, or something as simple as barbecue. I've learned that there are few state rivalries that are more passionate than the one that rages over barbecue. OK, barbecue may not have shaped our states, but it surely divides us as much as any border. It may seem small, but the way a state prefers to do its barbecue reveals a lot about its history. Take the Carolinas. Here, barbecue means one thing, pork. That's true in most southern barbecue hotspots on the map, including Memphis, Tennessee. In Texas, barbecue means beef, thanks to its cowboy traditions. Kansas City, Missouri uses both beef and pork. But there's a reason the Carolinas are considered the cradle of barbecue. And there's a reason why it has to be pork. Carolina traditions go back to the 18th century, when there were a lot more pigs here than people. Pigs brought by early explorers flourished in the warm, forested landscape where they could feed themselves easily. In the early days, barbecue wasn't just a meal. It was a social event born out of necessity. Well, in the old days, we didn't have refrigeration. You had to kill your hogs in the wintertime. You didn't kill them in the summer. And even today, around here, people kill, do most of the hog killing in the wintertime or the cold weather. So they're going to work outdoors, they've got to have refrigeration, natural refrigeration. To a Carolinian, pork became the only kind of barbecue. In places like Lexington, North Carolina, it's like religion. Just try telling anyone around here that their way isn't the right way to smoke meat or that barbecue isn't all about the sauce. What is typical North Carolina okay. barbecue sauce? In North Carolina, in this part of the country, it's vinegar and ketchup and spices, sugar, salt, red pepper, black pepper. Down the east, which is a similar, they got about the same thing, but they leave out the vinegar. Then if you go on to go down to South Carolina, you, you might leave out the ketchup and put in mustard. So in this area, though, we all use the ketchup. Taking a taste of this historic food is part of the job. After all, somebody's got to do it. This is sort of juicy, tender, all pork, of course, no beef, and kind of like a tangy quality in all the spices, a little red pepper. As we've seen, several states stand out for their rebelliousness, but there's one that may well be the granddaddy of them all. Yep, Texas. It's so independent, it practically thinks it's a country. And there's one big way that it even acts like one. How many power grids are in America? Never thought about that before. No one's judging you here. All right. No one's going to give you a grade. I'm going to say four. Four? I'm just going to go at a guess of the larger city. Just several million viewers will observe you do this. I'd say between five and ten. Three. Yeah, that's correct. That is correct. There are three power grids. Our nation's electricity is interconnected through networks of power lines that form our power grids. But with one big exception, the power grids that cover the continental U.S. are divided between East, West, and Texas. We're talking about something very significant here, and that is the source of your power. This is electricity. This is our power system, our power grid. Is, and what is so unique about it? It's, uh, we ha it's, our grid is wholly contained within the state of Texas and is not connected to the other grids in America. And this is a source of pride and it's part of a, maybe a, an expression of our independence, but we like having our own grid. You see, when Texans say they've got a lot of power, they're not kidding. They even pay a little less for it than the national average. Their grid was established during World War II. Texas needed to keep its war factories running, and it had the natural resources to do it on its own. A lot of our capability for energy comes from the fact that the energy resources happen to be here. So we're good at oil and gas because we had oil and gas. It's not that we're more brilliant or anything in the state, but we had the resources and we had this sort of frontier attitude, and those go to well together. 
Texas as a whole guzzles more energy than any other state. But it's also the leading producer of crude oil, natural gas, and even wind power. And since all that happens within its own borders, the state avoids most federal energy rules and runs its power like the self-reliant state it is. In fact, Texans wear their pride on their sleeves. Texas is not like any other state in the United States of America. This is a foreign country. It actually matches. Oh, it's the same color. Uh, our. I consider myself a female, Hispanic, Texan, and an American. In that order. In that order. <laughs> Texans want to be sure we get their point loud and clear. Sometimes their cavalier attitude is hidden in plain sight. Here at the Capitol in Austin, Texas, the architects studied the U.S. Capitol building, and then they built their own, 15 feet higher. Go inside, and it's abundantly clear, this state was once its own country. Here in the Capitol Rotunda, on the floor, is the seal for the Republic of Texas. It takes center stage, surrounded by the seals of places that were lucky enough to lay claim to Texas. Over here, Spain. Here, France. Over here, Mexico. Here, the Confederacy. And this seal, a little place we know as America. So Texas's independent streak is firmly rooted in its history. It was a republic for nine years, from 1836 to 1845. Back then, it stretched all the way up into what's now Wyoming. Before that, it was part of Mexico. This enormous shape and the history that goes with it planted the state's rebellious roots. Many of the original colonists who came to Texas in the 1820s and 1830s were quite literally, outlaws. They were fleeing something in the United States. They were fleeing debt in very many cases. They were fleeing indictments. Some were fleeing murder charges. Not surprisingly, that kind of disdain for the law persisted. This problem with authority shaped Texas from the start. It fought hard, including at the Alamo, to win freedom from Mexico. As a state, it left the Union for the Confederacy in 1861. And even today, it's not unusual for Texas to threaten to secede. Have you ever heard of a secessionist movement? What state in our Union is most likely to secede? Like by itself? Yeah, I mean, once it leaves, it's on its own. Mm. That's a great question. Probably gonna be Texas. Right here. Texas. Yes. Texas, yeah. Texas, Texas got a big, big secession movement. Yeah. Yeah. Get rid of them. We don't need them anyway. All they have is a lot of space and cattle, and we better get back to vegetables. <laughs> but if Texas has always been so big and mighty, wouldn't it have been happier staying on its own? What was life like in Texas when it was its own country? It was terrible. And that's the ironic thing about it. It was the worst time in Texas history, but there's a kind of historical amnesia that has set in, that it's romanticized. The, the government of the Republic was broke. People couldn't guarantee land rights. The period that Texans would come to cherish later, the period of the Texas Republic, was really a result of the fact that they were jilted by the United States, and the United States wouldn't have them for nine years. Today's Texans might take issue but the fact is, the Texas Republic desperately wanted into the Union and was willing to compromise to get its shape. It was drowning in debt, so the Texas Republic traded parts of its land to the U.S. government for cash. It entered the Union when slavery was banned above a certain latitude on the map, so it lopped off another chunk to keep its slaves. Congress offered Texas the chance to divide into five states, but the Lone Star wouldn't play along. By then, there really was, I think, a sense of a Texan, and they were not about to divide that and become something else. That sense of a Texan is as powerful now as when Texas became a state, 
And just like many of our state identities, that history is hidden in the map. What is it in its structure, the way the state is shaped, that reinforces this idea that Texas is not really in it 100%? Part of it is a matter of geography. Texas straddles the South and the West, and it's the only state really to do that. If you're in East Texas, you're in the Old South. If you're in West Texas, you're in the frontier West. And because Texas spans that frontier, Texans are neither part of the South nor part of the West. I'm trying to find the answer to this question. What would happen to me if I messed with Texas? I guess it depends on who's standing around. Uh, they throw you in jail and put you on death row. You get a boot up your ass. <laughs> Most people would give it a little thought, and it, it's just a little scary, because immediately a Texan has an answer for you on what will happen to you if you mess with Texas. What happens to someone if they do mess with Texas? They can boot it out. If you do it at the wrong setting, like at a Friday night high school football game, that's where you don't want to Don't yeah. mess with Texas yeah. at a Friday night football game. I like your candor, your honesty. I appreciate that. Boot up your ass. <laughs> Texans are nothing if not strong-minded, and their take-no-prisoners attitude permeates the state's culture, even their laws. Take Houston, for example. Most other cities have zoning laws telling you what you can build where, not Houston. This is the only major U.S. city with no zoning laws. That means a guy can cover his house with 50,000 beer cans and remain just another neighbor on the street. Texas has a tremendous property rights um, bias written into law. That's the way it is in Texas. And so what's the result of that? I think. Texans, and I think there is that sort of an archetype of maybe it's my land, get off of it, or come and have a beer, but it's my land, <laughs> right? So a house like this is allowed to exist next to a townhouse, and it gets stranger than that. Bars very close to schools, rifle ranges next to bottled gas. It may sound crazy, but Houstonians like it this way. In three votes over 45 years, they've said no to zoning laws. The absence of zoning can, can be this, uh, can result in this sort of great diversity, or it can be chaos. I think there's a fearlessness that you have to possess to live here in a way, because people do like to have things compartmentalized, right? Where I know in that next block, I have an idea what's going to be there, you know, and you, you just don't have that security here. Case in point, I've got a little surprise for you. Oh, my, what a lovely day. And what a beautiful home behind me. But what's wrong with this picture? In a scenic neighborhood by Galveston Bay, Anything can move in next door, including the Boardwalk Bullet. How often does this um, roller coaster come screaming through your uh, house? It's, it's running pretty much all day long, uh, from, you know, about 10 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. So w we're talking about hundreds of people yes. every minute or so. Uh, screaming, yeah, that's yelling. The, that's the worst part, the screaming. Tim may not like his new neighbor, but he seems to be adopting a Texan attitude. I just get the sense that you look at this and you go, oh, well, that's life. Yeah. Um, and we're going to... We're going to be a part of it. We're going to be part of this story. Yeah, we live there, we're going to be a part of it, yes. So from the start, Texans have always tried to set their own terms. And even today, no one tells them where to put their roller coasters or how to get their power. They're both connected to the unique shape of Texas. Take another look at the Lone Star State. You'll see another clue to why they do things their own way. 
We've seen how history shaped Carolina's barbecue. The same goes for Texas barbecue. And it's all hidden in a lost state on the map. The 1840s, waves of Germans immigrate to Texas. They dream of establishing a state of their own called a Delsverein. Rolls right off the tongue, right? Well, in the end, their dream fades. But the Germans still left an indelible mark on the map. When German and Czech immigrants arrived here in the Texas Hill Country in the 1800s, they were already masters at butchering meat. But when they met up with the cowboys from the state's great cattle ranches, well, it was a marriage made in barbecue heaven. Just 80 miles from that early settlement is Lockhart, Texas, officially the barbecue capital of the state. And here, the German connection still rules. Your family came here from Germany. Well, my, I guess, great-grandfather came from Germany. He was first-generation immigrant over here. Just like in the Carolinas, the history here has led to some strong opinions. I think the battles in Texas, who's best in Texas is best in the world. You don't even think outside the borders of Texas? Well, to me, barbecue is Texas. Texas barbecue was born on the open range. Cowboys used a long, slow fire to coax a decent meal out of the wild cattle that roamed the Texas plains. So in Texas, barbecue means beef. And unlike in the Carolinas, it's often without sauce. Barbecue sauce is something we added about five years ago. Really? Before you never that, did that, we didn't, never needed to have it. And for Texas barbecue, you don't need forks either. This is all about fingers, eating it with your fingers. Mm. That is absolutely delicious. I'm not trying to turn barbecue into a political statement, but you do get the sense that there's not a lot of red tape down here telling you where to put your ovens, where to place your fires, how close you can sit to the fire. I'm actually sitting in the fire right now. And I'm, I'm smoked. We visited several states famous for their independent streets and seen how their rebellious attitudes and unique shapes are rooted in their histories. But there's another state on our map whose motto gets right to the point. Does Missouri have like a, a nickname? It's the show me state. Show me state. The show me state. The show me state. Yes. What are you supposed to show them? What is, what's being shown? Who's showing what? Prove it, prove it. Whatever it is, prove it. I'm a lawyer and we, you know, we want everybody to prove everything. So does that mean Missourians are like skeptical people? They just don't, they have, they have trust issues? I mean, you can't just come down here and tell me that for instance, that I host a TV show? Right, and I just say, okay, cool, that's fine. What if I don't show you? Then it ain't show me stay. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's like I gotta see your show. You gotta see it yeah, to I gotta, believe what, it. What channels it on? Now, does that mean it's on the history? history. No, I'm just saying. Oh, okay. Missourians here in Kansas City specialize in showing the rest of us something they're sure they do best. Oh, Sounds exactly. like you're supposed to show them something specific. Like, show me what? I guess maybe show them the barbecue, because this is probably the barbecue capital of the world. Kansas City earned its title as the crossroads of barbecue because of its history. This was a railroad center, full of stockyards, the final stop for many cattle drives heading up from Texas. The rails and their interstate links brought Kansas City a blend of great barbecue traditions. At Arthur Bryant's, you find a mix of meats, both beef and pork, and a devotion to doing barbecue the Kansas City way. What is in the oath to barbecue? You want to take it? Yeah. Okay. Could I? There are many oaths we take. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. You, you know you have barbecue on your hand. We take an oath when we get married. We take an oath when we 
are a juror in a court of law. I do solemnly swear. I do solemnly swear. To objectively and subjectively evaluate. To objectively and subjectively evaluate. Each barbecue meat. Each barbecue meat. And then there is the oath to swear allegiance to barbecue. And the American way of life. The American way of life. May be strengthened and preserved forever. May strengthened and preserved forever. That's it. You're on your oath. Kansas City reportedly has more barbecue joints than any other town in the U.S. Who's Let me get a... I got it, I got it. Does Kansas City have the best barbecue? To me, yeah. Yeah? You're not down with the Texas barbecue? I'm not down with the Texas barbecue. How come? I don't know. I just like our barbecue. You care for North Carolina barbecue or Memphis barbecue or... Honestly, uh... no offense to the other cities. I don't ever even care to try when I'm out of town. <laughs> so look at it. It don't look like nothing I'm familiar with. <laughs> I'll stick to what I know. You got to show me, man. It may seem small, but barbecue is a perfect connection to a bigger story hidden in the American map. Some states took shape because of a fierce independent streak. It's why Texas isn't broken up into five states. Or why there are two Carolinas. Or why Montana took a piece of Idaho. Every state's unique past fuels its passionate and divergent opinions today. Whether it's who can sell a gun, where to build a house, or yes, even the best way to barbecue meat. Because every state has a unique history, each one also has a unique say.